Okay, it's 202 now. Uh, let's get started. Hi there, welcome everyone to Ask Seminar Series. I'm John, the Seminar Coordinator. I will be moderating the seminar with uh, Kathy Medley, uh, who is our Communication Manager. Um, and our Associate Director, Rob Ferrero, is here and he will be introducing the speaker. Just so you know, then the seminar is being recorded and we're, we will publish the recording on our YouTube channel. And we have uh, two more seminars um, coming up, so please stay tuned. Um, and um, after the presentation, uh, we will have the Q&A session, so please feel free to ask any questions. And before uh, the speaker gets started, I will hand this over to uh, Raf, our uh, director. Um, to... So Raf, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah thanks, John. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to um, introduce our speaker. Uh, professor Kagan McCall. He's at uh, Harvard University. He's assistant professor there, um, jointly appointed with the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences and the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Um, let's see, he started there 2018, um, PhD for MIT 2017. He's um, at several awards and recognitions, and I uh, look forward to hearing. Um, it's going to be a pretty interesting talk. It's going to explain to us about surface humidity distributions and, and why they exist. So turn it over to uh, Kagan. Uh, thanks. Yeah, Ralph and John and Kazzy. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about some work today that um, conducted in collaboration with my former graduate student, Lois Tang, who graduated earlier this year. Okay, so um, this is a map of the climatology of near surface relative humidity over land from the ERA5 reanalysis. And as you probably know, relative humidity is the ratio of the specific humidity, a measure of the absolute water vapor content of the atmosphere, to the saturation specific humidity, which is an upper bound on the specific humidity that's dictated by the Clausius Clapeyron relation, a strong increasing function of temperature. And so what we're showing here is the near surface relative humidity, literally in the lowest few meters um, of the atmosphere. And we're interested in understanding the spatial variation we see in this figure. And we're interested in that both for its own sake as understanding a fundamentally important climate variable, but also because of all the places in the atmosphere to understand relative humidity, understanding how it behaves near the land surface is really important for a variety of applications, including, for instance, um, human heat stress. So all else being equal, when temperatures are high, they are more unpleasant and more dangerous to humans when relative humidity is also high, all else being equal. Ecosystems and plants in particular have their own responses to relative humidity. And of course, humans and plants primarily spend their time in the lowest few metres of the atmosphere rather than higher up in the atmosphere or far out to sea. So for all these reasons, we want to understand near surface relative humidity over land. Um, and while there has been a lot of nice work on relative humidity in general, perhaps surprisingly, there is no simple explanation for the spatial structure of near surface relative humidity over land that we see in this figure. And none of this previous work neatly translates to the near surface environment either. Um, I think it's kind of shocking, frankly, that in 2024, we don't have a simple explanation for this figure. And so we're going to endeavor to provide one here. I should say as well that the fact that um, this is a simple question might um, lead you to imagine that the answer is simple or perhaps even obvious or trivial. And I'm going to show you that that's not the case. Okay, so um, in this talk, I'm going to um, talk about a recent theory for near surface relative humidity over land that we published earlier this year. Um, and I'm going to motivate its development with a few applications. So the first I'll start by talking about is understanding why the latitudinal profile of near surface relative humidity is shaped like the letter W. Um, I'll also use the theory to 
um, resolve a debate that exists in the climate sciences about the degree to which land surfaces get drier with warming or not. And there are other applications of the theory too. I don't have time to talk about them today, but they're in the second paper cited below the Tang and McColl in review paper. Okay, so as I mentioned, there's very little work on near surface relative humidity over land. Um, so given that, we might as well start with the big picture. And so here we're now zooming out to look at the zonal and annual average of near surface relative humidity averaged over land from the ERA-5 reanalysis. And you can see it has this non-trivial spatial structure. It looks a little bit like the letter W turned on its side with these minima in the subtropics. And so a natural question to ask is, why does it take on this non-trivial structure? Okay, so sometimes people look at this and they say, well, it's obvious, you know, the tropics are wet and the subtropics are dry, so this is all just obvious. Um, so let's take that explanation seriously. Let's say that near surface relative humidity is largely a, ref a reflection of the wetness or water vapor content of the near surface atmosphere. More precisely, it's specific humidity. Well, that explanation is incorrect. As you can see on the right here, we're plotting the specific humidity profile. It essentially declines monotonically from the equator to the pole. There's no, there's no sign of this W-shaped profile. On the left, I'm plotting the same thing, but I've normalized it by the land average saturation specific humidity just to give these two quantities similar units. And the main point is that the red line doesn't look anything like the black line, not even qualitatively. So what this means is the near surface relative humidity profile is not primarily a reflection of the water vapor content of the near surface atmosphere. Okay, so if it's not primarily determined by specific humidity, perhaps it's primarily determined by the other quantity in relative humidity, the saturation specific humidity. Um, so again, we can plot that on the right. And you can see again that there's no obvious features in that profile that would cause relative humidity to take on this W-shaped profile on its own. And just to emphasize that point on the left, I'm plotting the land averaged specific humidity divided by the zonally varying saturation specific humidity. So if the W-shaped profile in relative humidity was primarily determined by zonal variations in saturation specific humidity, we would expect this blue line to look like the black line, at least qualitatively, and it clearly doesn't. Okay, so at this point, we might start casting around in a more ad hoc fashion for other quantities that might explain this W-shaped profile. Um, relate other quantities vaguely related to water in some way. And so we might um, look at precipitation, for instance, and that sort of looks a bit more like the relative humidity profile. It has these minima in the subtropics, um, but the peak in the tropics is much too large. And more generally, precipitation has completely different um, units and completely different scale. And it's not really clear why of all the sort of water quantities that we might choose, why precipitation would be the thing that controls near surface relative humidity either. Finally, after some investigation, we might eventually conclude that arguably of all the quantities that we might look at and consider here, soil moisture looks um, arguably the most like near surface relative humidity over land. Uh, so that's shown on the right here. You can see it has this sort of characteristic W shape. Um, it uh, even has similar um, spatial scale. It varies between zero and one. The peak in the tropics is not too high like it is for precipitation. So clearly these two quantities are correlated, but it's not really at all obvious why they should be tightly correlated or more generally, why should relative humidity in the near surface environment look more like the storage of water in the soil than it does like the storage of water in the near surface atmosphere, the specific humidity more precisely? I think that's not at all obvious um, and sort of needs some sort of explanation. Um, <clears throat> one explanation that sometimes people propose when they see this figure is that well, what's going on is there's some atmospheric mechanism that is causing relative humidity to take on this spatial structure. Um, that causes dry air to descend to the surface um, in the subtropics. Um, that dry air in turn dries out the soil and causes the soil moisture profile to also take on this W-shaped structure. 
So in this telling, the land surface is passively responding to atmospheric dynamics. So the soil moisture um, profile here is just passively responding to the relative humidity profile that's being set by other mechanisms. So again, we can take this explanation seriously. Let's call this the atmosphere only mechanism, one in which dry air in the atmosphere causes high evaporation at the surface, and that causes the soil to dry out. So another way of sort of framing this question is we're really asking here, are land mechanisms essential to producing the W-shaped profile in near surface relative humidity? Um, in this explanation, they're not essential. This is just, it's passively responding to atmospheric dynamics. So one way in which we can test this um, sort of mechanism is by looking at simulations in which there is no land, um, so-called aquaplanet simulations. And if those simulations produce a W-shaped profile in the surface relative humidity, then that suggests that maybe we don't even need land and that, that this really is the true mechanism behind it. So there are tons of aquaplanet simulations that have already been published in the literature. Here's a figure from one of those studies. So on the x-axis, we have latitude. On the y-axis, we have vertical sigma coordinates. And the main thing to focus on here are the colours, which correspond to relative humidity in the atmosphere. And again, we're focused on the near-surface environment, which I've deliberately hidden for now. OK, so what you can see is that in this figure, high up in the atmosphere, there is, in fact, a W-shaped profile in relative humidity. You have high relative humidity in the tropics, and then it declines as you move towards the poles, and then it increases again. So maybe that's all there is to it. Maybe the relative humidity profile is just set by atmospheric dynamics, and then that W-shape translates down to the surface, and we don't need land to produce it in the near-surface atmosphere. So again, as it turns out, that explanation is incorrect because in these aquaplanet simulations, you can see that there's no strong W shape in the relative humidity profile near the surface, which is the part of the atmosphere that we're focused on here, um, even though it is present higher up in the atmosphere. So what this means is the atmosphere only mechanism is not the dominant mechanism. And the answer to the question at the top, are land mechanisms essential, is yes, you don't get the W-shaped profile unless you have a land surface interacting with the atmosphere. Another way to see this is by looking at other mechanism denial experiments. So rather than looking at worlds where you only have ocean, we can look at worlds where you only have land and have no ocean at all. So this is, um, there are many studies that look at these. Here's one from the planetary sciences. So here they're simulating a sort of quasi-Earth-like world, um, similar temperature structure. It's got a Hadley circulation. Um, and on this land planet, they fix soil moisture to a um, specific structure. So on most of the, and I should say here, what they're showing is this thing called the evaporation efficiency. That's essentially the same as soil moisture. One corresponds to a saturated surface, zero corresponds to a bone dry surface. So on this planet, they're fixing soil moisture and they're making it so that on most of the planet, soils are completely dry. And at the tropics, soils are, oh, sorry, at the poles rather, soils are completely saturated. So this is quite unlike our own planet. And so after fixing soil moisture, they run the model and they it simulates a relative humidity distribution. And what they find is that near surface relative humidity in particular tracks the imposed soil moisture distribution here. So you have very low relative humidity in regions where you are fixing very low soil moisture and you have high relative humidity in areas where you are fixing high relative humidity elsewhere. And this is an extreme example, but there are much less extreme examples on worlds that are more Earth-like that also confirm this point. So in these simulations, because you're fixing soil moisture, any correlation between soil moisture and relative humidity is fundamentally being caused by the fact that soil moisture variability is causing relative humidity variability. Okay, so what we've seen is that this W-shaped profile in relative humidity is also present in soil moisture, and it's not simply due to the land surface passively responding to atmospheric dynamics. In fact, the land surface is essential um, to reproducing this W-shaped profile. And if anything, 
um, it seems that the soil moisture profile is determining the relative humidity profile in some way. So all of the evidence I've presented so far has come from climate model simulations and climate models are great for many things, but in the near surface environment, they're parameterizing many of the most important processes, you know, related to the boundary layer and clouds, let alone once you get to the land surface and there are many poorly constrained parameters there. So what we really want to understand this structure and understand its link to soil moisture is an explanation that is independent of climate models, that is quantitatively accurate, that is based on simple physics that we can understand, and that is parsimonious. So we're going to aim to throw out as much complexity as we can get away with while still um, retaining the most important ingredients to reproduce this phenomenon. So the approach that we take is by looking at a column of air in radiative convective equilibrium. So the approach I'm about to outline has a long history in the atmospheric sciences. Um, it's been typically used to understand hydrological sensitivity, that is how precipitation changes with warming. Um, all of that work has been conducted over oceans and to my knowledge this is the first time this approach has been employed over land. So in this schematic here, we have a column of air. We identify three heights in pressure coordinates, the um, surface, the top of the atmosphere where P is zero, and the height of the lifting condensation level, that PLCL height there. You can think of this roughly as, the, as cloud base height. Um, at the surface, we have a sensible heat flux H and a latent heat flux corresponding to evaporation. Okay, so the first energy budget that we look at in this column is the energy budget of the layer of air lying below the lifting condensation level. And we hypothesize here that at steady state, the dominant terms in this energy budget are the sensible heat flux, which heats the layer of air, and um, cooling terms related to radiative cooling and precipitation re-evaporation, which is the cooling that arises when raindrops falling through the subsaturated um, atmosphere below the LCL uh, evaporate before they hit the surface. We've written these cooling terms as the product of a normalized pressure depth, this PS minus PLCL term here. So the difference between the pressure at the surface and the pressure at the LCL, you can think of as a depth of the layer of air in pressure coordinates. And these cooling rate terms, um, which have units of Kelvin per time. Okay, so if we imagine for argument's sake um, that the cooling rates don't change much, then one way of thinking about this conceptually is that in an environment with a larger sensible heat flux, we require a deeper lifting condensation level to generate sufficient cooling to balance out that large sensible heat flux. Okay, the second um, energy budget we look at is that of the entire column. And since the column's in radiative convective equilibrium, um, the balance is simply between surface fluxes and radiative cooling. Um, now, this is a strong approximation and radiative convective equilibrium is only strictly true in the global mean. It's often used as a useful approximation of the time and space averaged tropics. Um, however, recent work has shown that its utility extends beyond the tropics into mid-latitudes, at least in an approximate form, um, as far as about 40 degrees from the equator or so. So this is some nice work from some folks at the University of Chicago published a couple of years ago. They looked in the ERA-5 reanalysis in the zonal and annual mean and found that RCE remains an at least approximately reasonable um, approximation um, as far as about 40 degrees from the equator or so. And the reason they gave for this result is that the presence of land, um, this low heat capacity surface, makes RCE a more reasonable approximation. So we're going to take advantage of this recent work to argue that while our theory is written in terms of RCE, um, its validity extends to about 40 degrees from the equator or so. Now, as you move further north, 
the theory has to start breaking down because radio convective equilibrium becomes an increasingly poor approximation, particularly as you get into high latitudes where um, the, the balance is more like radiative advective equilibrium instead. But nevertheless, most land lies between 40 degrees north and 40 degrees south. Okay, so um, RCE is, of course, ignoring advection. It's ignoring convergence. Advection and convergence, of course, are not zero. They're very important for many aspects of climate. All that we're saying is they are not essential to reproducing the spatial structure of near-surface relative humidity over land. Okay, the second component of the theory is essentially a simple land surface model where we are here relating um, the evaporative fraction to soil moisture. So this simple land surface model has a long history in the literature. This is a figure from a review paper published in 2010. So this idea was old back in 2010. Um, and the basic idea is that as you increase the water content of the soil, the fraction of energy available at the surface, available for surface fluxes, is increasingly petitioned to evaporation and evaporation will increase too. Um, above some threshold, adding more water doesn't further increase evaporation. Energy, the, the system is now energy limited rather than water limited. But at the spatial and temporal scales we're looking at here, that is the zonal and annual mean, much of the land surface is in this transitional water limited regime. So a simple way to think about this is the evaporative fraction, which is the ratio of the latent heat flux to the sum of the surface fluxes, can be thought of as essentially a proxy for soil moisture. As soil moisture goes up as a first approximation, so does the evaporative fraction. So what we're going to do is derive a theory for near surface relative humidity over land in terms of the evaporative fraction. And you can think of that as simply a proxy for soil moisture itself. Okay, I'm going to spend one slide on deriving the theory. Um, if this is not your thing, you can feel free to tune out and then tune back in again on the next slide. So we start by combining the two energy budgets I mentioned earlier to diagnose the evaporative fraction. And we get this equation here in terms of the normalized pressure height of the lifting condensation level and this ratio of cooling rates, which um, for now we're just going to call beta and we'll come back to in a second. Next, we can take an exact relation for the height of the lifting condensation level and substitute that in. And the important thing that happens here is we now have some dependence on relative humidity at the surface entering the picture. That's that RH term in the denominator there. And of course, that's because um, the height of the lifting condensation level is a strong function of the near surface relative humidity. Okay, there's also some other stuff in this equation, some thermodynamic constants. Um, this thing here is called the Lambert W function. Um, this is all kind of complicated and it would be nice if we could simplify it somewhat um, without losing too much accuracy. And it turns out we can if we make a change of variables and we linearize around a saturated atmosphere. We can um, get an approximation that looks like this and it's a very good approximation for typical Earth-like conditions. So um, this equation includes a new term alpha, which I haven't written the equation for, but that is basically just a function of thermodynamic constants and it has some weak temperature sensitivity. So in the ERA5 reanalysis, it varies between about 0.21 and 0.26. Um, so in the spirit of maximum simplicity here, we're just gonna call it a quarter and fix it at that value. Beta is a little more difficult to constrain. There are some back of the envelope arguments that you can make that it should lie somewhere between about one and 10. Um, <clears throat> but what we can do in practice and what we actually did was run a suite of cloud permitting simulations. So these are simulations that resolve much more of the turbulence in the boundary layer and sort of convective processes that are not resolved by climate models. Um, they include, you know, full radiative transfer, microphysics, et cetera. And we simulated 11 worlds in radiative convective equilibrium um, over a land surface. <clears throat> 
And we varied the top of atmosphere insulation to create a range of different climates from quite hot to quite cold. And we varied, we fixed the soil moisture in these land simulations and varied them between saturated soils and quite dry soils. So combined these 11 simulations in RCE span a pretty wide range of potential climates. And in those simulations, we were able to diagnose each of these terms and therefore to diagnose beta. And what we found is across this very wide range of conditions, <clears throat> beta varied in these simulations between about three and six. So that's a pretty narrow range. And so we might as well fix it to be a constant in the spirit of maximum simplicity here. And we might as well choose it to be a value consistent with that range that makes our life simpler. And so if we choose beta equal to four, then this reduces to this equation. And if we rearrange that, we get the theory in its simplest form that looks like this. So this is um, the, the final equation for the theory in its simplest form. It's a very simple theory. It simply says here that the as the evaporative fraction or soil moisture increases, so does relative humidity. There's a little bit of curvature um, for drier um, soils down here. There's no calibrated parameters here at all. It's just that equation. But notwithstanding that, the theory performs pretty well in our cloud permitting simulations. So here, each dot represents the average from one of our cloud permitting simulations. Um, and so on the x-axis, we've got the actual near surface relative humidity. On the y-axis, we've got the predicted value from the theory given the um, simulated evaporative fraction from each simulation. Now, you might say that the theory was um, partially um, derived using these cloud permitting simulations. So perhaps that suggests that there's something a bit circular here. So we can also test the theory in a completely independent data set that's unrelated to any of these. And so we go to the ERA5 reanalysis here, you can see the black line is showing the actual near surface relative humidity profile. And the red line is showing the profile that's predicted by this simple theory, given the evaporative fraction from the ERA5 reanalysis. And as you can see, the theory does pretty well. Um, even in, and I, just to mention this again, there's no tuning or calibration going on here. This is just the equation in the green box on the left. Even in the parts where the theory performs poorly, so at higher latitudes here, that is itself consistent with the theory. So we, as I mentioned earlier, the theory is based on radiative convective equilibrium. Radiative convective equilibrium becomes an increasingly poor approximation as you move beyond 40 degrees north towards the poles. And as we expected, the theory performs poorly as you move closer to the poles. So what this tells us is it's unlikely that we are simply getting the right answer for the wrong reasons, because the theory works where we expect it to work and it fails where we expect it to fail to. Okay, so this is a diagnostic theory, meaning that on its own, it doesn't tell us about causality per se. What does tell us about causality are uh, the mechanism denial experiments that we've run here and that others have run. So in our simulations, we fixed soil moisture to a certain value. And then across these fixed soil moisture simulations, we observed that relative humidity was well correlated with soil moisture. Um, and so what that implies is that that soil moisture variability is causing the relative humidity variability in our simulations um, by design. And um, this is true in a variety of other simulations dating back at least as far as Delworth and Bay, 1989. So all up, this tells us these mechanism denial experiments both here and in previous studies show that variability in soil moisture and the evaporative fraction is certainly sufficient to cause the observed variability in relative humidity. Now, that's not to say that variability in relative humidity doesn't cause any variability in soil moisture. It's just not essential to explaining the W-shaped profile here. Okay, so just to recap, the theory is saying that in an environment with dry soils, that implies a low evaporative fraction, a high sensible heat flux, that then requires a deep lifting condensation level to balance the heating from the sensible heat flux, and 
by definition, then a deep lifting condensation level requires a low relative humidity, just by definition. Um, in contrast, in a wet environment with high soil moisture, that implies a high evaporative fraction, a low sensible heat flux, that in turn requires a shallow lifting condensation level, and by definition, that requires a high relative humidity. Okay, so returning to our original question, we um, wanted to explain this W-shaped profile. We noted that it looks quite a bit like soil moisture, and we'd sort of asked the question, why does near-surface relative humidity look more like the storage of water in the soil than it does like the storage of water in the atmosphere, the specific humidity. And our theory basically provides a direct answer to this question because it shows that relative humidity is, it predicts that it's a strong function of the evaporative fraction and therefore of soil moisture. Okay, so a natural question at this point to ask is, okay, relative humidity is largely determined by the distribution of soil moisture. What determines the distribution of soil moisture? Um, and um, that's a good question. Sometimes an implication behind that question is that there might be some more general set of processes or mechanisms that are setting the soil moisture distribution. So yes, soil moisture is a partial explanation for the relative humidity profile, but the full general explanation is in terms of some atmospheric mechanisms that still remain to be, to be found. Um, so it is certainly the case that soil moisture is strongly determined by atmospheric processes, in particular precipitation and net radiation. They explain much of the observed natural variability in soil moisture over land. But there is very important variability in soil moisture that is not explained by these processes and has no prospect of being explained by atmospheric processes um, either. So for example, Groundwater fed systems. These are um, regions where most of the water evaporated is not coming from modern precipitation. It's coming from large storages of water underground that accumulated in past wet climates. So this is one particularly extreme example. This is the Katara Depression in the Sahara Desert. Um, this is obviously a region that gets next to no rainfall in the current climate. Um, but if you go there, you'll find wet soils, marshlands, even standing water and lakes. And most of the water that is being evaporated here and that you see is not coming from rainfall. It is coming from water that is seeping out of the ground, out of these um, storages. So it's fed by groundwater. And it's been... Um, fed by these groundwater storages for the last 10,000 years. It'll probably continue to be fed by these storages for thousands of years more. So this is an extreme example, but groundwater fed systems are prevalent all over the world. There was an inventory of these systems that was published in Nature earlier this year. And they estimated conservatively that something like a third of all dry lands include these groundwater fed systems. So these, this is not some pathological edge case. This is um, a common source of variability in soil moisture in different parts of the world. Another example of a situation in which soil moisture is not primarily determined by atmospheric mechanisms is in irrigated regions. So in these regions, water is being deliberately pumped out of groundwater aquifers um, to increase soil moisture to a level above the amount it would um, uh, attain naturally. Um, and we irrigate a lot of land in this country and around the world too. <clears throat> so the bottom line here is that any truly definitive theory of near surface relative humidity over land has to be able to explain why irrigated areas um, persistently show higher near surface relative humidity compared to surrounding non-irrigated regions, why things like urbanization and deforestation and other modifications to the land surface that have nothing to do with atmospheric processes also change near surface relative humidity. The main point here is that 
there's important variability in soil moisture that is not explained by atmospheric processes. And so for that reason, soil moisture really is the most general explanation for near surface relative humidity over land. Okay, um, so we've introduced the theory and we've used it to explain why the relative humidity profile has a shape like the letter W. Um, to finish up, I'm going to show that the relative humidity profile is useful in resolving a sort of conflict in the literature on the extent to which land surfaces are likely to dry. Okay, so one of the most um, basic questions we can ask about climate change is, on average, does climate change make land surfaces wetter or drier? And obviously some places get wetter, some places get drier, but is there anything we can say about the global land average itself? The most common answer to this question today is that climate change causes land surfaces to get drier on average. And this idea has a long history. Um, it was perhaps popularised in this piece in science 10 years ago, and um, it's common still today. So this is a recent paper arguing that we face um, not, a, not only a drier future, but an even drier future. And there's also this associated notion of dry land expansion, whereby areas we currently classify as dry lands expand their boundaries into surrounding regions um, systematically as the planet warms. And even some people who argue we not only face dry land expansion, we face accelerating dry land expansion with warming. So these are just a handful of papers. This is a very common view in the literature and there are many, many others too that make these claims. Um, there's a lot written on this um, and the precise mechanism differs somewhat from study to study. Um, I just want to briefly summarise some common elements to these arguments across studies for why people think this is the case. Okay, so first, um, it's believed that atmospheric water supply or precipitation increases with warming. Um, the second point is about atmospheric water demand or potential evaporation. So potential evaporation is the amount of evaporation you would have from a region if that region had abundant water to evaporate. So if we think about the Sahara Desert again, um, it's very sunny and very hot there, but there's not much water to evaporate in the first place. So as a result, there's very little evaporation in the Sahara Desert. But if we were to irrigate or flood the Sahara Desert, then the evaporation rate would become very large because there's plenty of water now to evaporate. So in other words, the Sahara Desert has a low evaporation rate, but a very high potential evaporation rate, or it has very high atmospheric water demand. Okay, so it's hypothesized that atmospheric water demand primarily scales with the vapor pressure deficit over land. And that's just the difference between the saturation specific humidity and the specific humidity. Third, it's argued that vapor pressure deficit increases with warming more rapidly than precipitation. And so fourth, because demand increases faster than supply, this implies that land surfaces have to dry with warming. Okay, so just to make this point more clearly, I'm going to show a figure that's showing changes in various quantities in climate models projected into the future under warming. And I should say here, I've simply just digitized a figure from this paper below by Peter Grieve and Mike Roderick and other co-authors. This is their work. Um, I'm just digitizing it here for the purposes of this talk. Okay, so you can see here that precipitation increases systematically, averaged over land, I should say. All of these plots are land averages globally. So precipitation increases with warming, but potential evaporation increases much faster. And that's because in this equation for potential evaporation, uh, there's a VPD term in it, and that increases very rapidly and causes potential evaporation to increase too. So the implication of this is that Demand exceeds supply, and that implies global drying. That's the basic argument for why we see global land drying. Okay, so this um, argument has received some pushback that um, I think was first written about in this paper by Mike Roderick and co-authors in Water Resources Research. And since, there's, since then, there's been a lot written on this topic, further developing these ideas, and, and our group has contributed to that discussion too. Basically, um, Roderick et al. identified two main problems with 
the supply and demand drying arguments. So the first problem they identified was that what we currently know, if anything, past warm climates were less arid, not more arid. And so this seems to conflict with the idea that warming necessarily implies greater aridity. The second uh, argument they put forward is that these projections here are based on climate models. So climate model simulated changes in precipitation and potential evaporation, and they're used to imply that we see um, large scale drying with warming. But those same climate models directly simulate the land surface and they directly simulate things like soil moisture and vegetation. And if you look in those climate models at those directly simulated quantities at the soil moisture and at the vegetation, then there's really no obvious sign of large scale drastic aridification going on in those simulations. So there seems like there's a contradiction or a problem here. And so they called this discrepancy between the supply and demand arguments and these other lines of evidence, the aridity paradox. Okay, so what it implies is that there's probably something wrong with this argument here. And so to cut to the chase, the part that's wrong is this part, the idea that atmospheric water demand scales with vapor pressure deficit over land. Um, and the main argument that's been provided for why that is wrong is that it fails to account for plant physiological responses to increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So entirely separate to the um, radiative response and the greenhouse effect, as you add CO2 to the atmosphere, plants increase their water use efficiency. They are more inclined to close their stomata earlier than they would have otherwise. And that has the overall effect of suppressing transpiration globally. So this green line corresponds to um, a different estimate of potential evaporation that um, Grieve and Roderick et al. provided in their paper um, in which they are empirically correcting for this plant physiological response to increasing CO2. And as you can see, the mismatch between supply and demand has decreased now when you factor that in. On the other hand, there's still a pretty big gap between supply and demand, even when you account for those plant physiological um, effects. And so at best, these plant physiological explanations only partially resolve the aridity paradox. So what I'm going to argue is that our theory for near surface relative humidity over land um, resolves the aridity paradox in a parsimonious way. And does so without invoking plant physiological arguments at all. Okay, so to understand what follows, we need to briefly recap some um, basic elements of potential evaporation. Um, that So this is a standard equation for potential evaporation that you would see in textbooks. I unfortunately don't have the time here to go through the derivation of this, but this is common textbook stuff. This equation has a name, it's called the Penman equation. Um, and what you can see is that potential evaporation is a function of various things, this sort of epsilon term, which is a function of some thermodynamic constants and temperature. It's a function of surface net radiation, this term here. It's got some minor wind dependence through this thing called the aerodynamic conductance, which in practice tends to be small over land. And this vapor pressure deficit term, which we've already seen. Okay, um, so... As we've also seen, um, vapor pressure deficit increases rapidly with warming. And so perhaps for this reason, when people do these studies where they look at how potential evaporation changes, they often focus on this VPD term to the extent that um, some studies even completely ignore the other stuff. So they'll literally just say that potential evaporation basically scales with vapor pressure deficit and the other stuff is secondary. So... The question is, is that a good approximation or not? Um, and so this is an approximation that can be tested by using observations and climate models. And people have done this. So you can go to times and places on Earth where soils are saturated and look at measurements of evaporation from global eddy covariance towers that exist. And when the soil is saturated, that means evaporation that is measured is equal to the potential evaporation rate. And you can then look at 
how much of the variability in potential evaporation is explained, for instance, by VPD and how much is explained by, for instance, net radiation, which tend to be the two main players here um, in general. You can do the same thing in climate models. You can look at times and places where the soil is saturated, look at the evaporation rate, and then look at how much of the variability in that evaporation rate is explained by net radiation versus VPD. Okay, so people have done these studies and what they consistently find is that potential evaporation over land is largely determined by net radiation, not vapor pressure deficit. That's true in observations and it's true in climate models and it's not especially close. So what both of these studies found is that um, in fact, the best estimates of potential evaporation that you could get were when you simply ignored the VPD term entirely and just focused on the net radiation term. You got the best estimates of potential evaporation by ignoring the VPD term entirely. And I just note, this is the exact opposite of what many studies do, where they ignore net radiation and focus on VPD. Okay, so this is, I think, very empirically well supported now, but it's not really clear why that's the case, I think. Um, and, you know, in fact, it's a bit confusing, like the equation for potential evaporation includes VPD in it, and we know VPD rises quickly with warming. So why should it be the case that potential evaporation actually is not very sensitive to VPD at all and is largely determined by net radiation? So I think our theory provides a simple answer to this, um, to this problem. So if you recall here, we're thinking about potential evaporation. So by definition, we're imagining a land surface that is saturated, has abundant um, water to uh, evaporate. Our theory directly predicts that in an environment with wet soils, that should cause there to be high relative humidity. So what our theory is saying is that in any equation for potential evaporation, if relative humidity is present in that equation, you should set it to be a high value rather than the observed value that you might have for that particular environment. So again, if we look at the Penman equation here, I've just rewritten it in terms of relative humidity now rather than vapor pressure deficit, same thing, but written in terms of relative humidity. And the theory says that that relative humidity term should be set to a large value. And because this is one minus relative humidity, um, that means this term is going to become small. And so what we end up with is the implication that a wetland surface will have caused there to be a potential evaporation rate that scales with net radiation. That VPD term will essentially disappear. Now, I've provided a sort of hand-waving version of the argument here. We approach it with um, a bit more rigour in the Tang and McColl paper that's in review and cited below. But this is the basic conceptual idea for what is going on here. And so what our theory does is it provides a concrete theoretical support for why potential evaporation scales with net radiation um, that is um, now supporting these empirically supported findings. Okay, so we've shown that atmospheric water demand doesn't scale with vapor pressure deficit. It in fact scales with net radiation instead. So what does this all mean for changes in aridity with warming? So I'm gonna conclude by arguing that um, it has profound implications. So if we return to our figure here, there's one additional line added in light blue here, which is showing changes in net radiation now with warming. And so what this you can see is that precipitation and net radiation basically increase at a more or less similar rate in these climate model simulations. So what that means is if you treat potential evaporation as effectively net radiation, which you should based on empirical evidence and now based on theoretical evidence that we've provided in our study, then this implies that supply and demand increase at similar rates, and there's effectively no reason to expect soils to dry with warming, um, as long as you use the correct estimate of um, atmospheric demand. Okay, so the bottom line here is that rather than expecting a widely drier future, there's really no reason based on these supply and demand arguments to expect soils to dry with warming since atmospheric demand and supply increase at similar rates, so long as you use the correct estimate of atmospheric demand.
Okay, so to conclude, we've introduced a theory for near surface relative humidity over land. Um, we've used it to explain some basic properties of the profile of near surface relative humidity over land. And then we've used it um, to approach this problem of the aridity paradox, the fact that supply and demand arguments imply that soils dry with warming, but that conflicts with other lines of evidence. We've shown that, in fact, our theory predicts that atmospheric demand scales with net radiation rather than vapor pressure deficit. And once you accept that point, then the aridity paradox goes away and there's no obvious reason to expect widespread drying because supply and demand increase at similar rates. And we're able to resolve the aridity paradox without invoking any of the plant physiological responses to CO2 that have been mainly used to resolve the aridity paradox or at least partially resolve it um, in the past. Okay, thanks for your attention. Thanks, Megan. So if anyone has any questions, now is the time to ask them. You can um, use the hand raise feature um, or you can type it in the chat and I'll read it out loud. So Weston, you can go ahead and start us off. Hi, Kay, and thanks for the seminar. I thought it was super interesting. Um, I had a question. I think I, I may have just missed this, but in the last line of argument, when you were talking about why, oh, sorry, muted myself, uh, why it makes sense to use the scaling of radiation only instead of VP, including anything about VPD, you argued that uh, when land is saturated, that makes sense. Uh, and I agree with that. I, I guess I missed, does it, does then, why, why can you generalize this? To the global total, knowing that not all land is saturated, there are some, uh, as you were pointing out, in in uh, when you have near dry soil moistures, uh, you would expect the opposite, right? I mean, your theory would imply that uh, when you have very dry soil moisture, that your near surface relative humidity does not necessarily scale with um, radiation, right? That it it would scale with vapor pressure deficit or is that is that not correct i guess i'm asking why why can't why do we not need to think about the dry or transitional climates when you uh generalize from saturated climates to uh global land surface as a whole yeah thanks weston so um the answer is that the mechanism proposed is in terms of demand and supply so by definition, even in an unsaturated environment, the arguments for why those regions should be expected to dry are built on arguments about the evaporation rate that would arise from that environment if it was in fact saturated. So what we're showing here is that that widespread drying is an artifact of the choice that has been made for that, um, for that potential evaporation rate. Um, so that's basically the argument is those supply and demand arguments are used to explain what's going on around the world, regardless of whether it is actually wet or dry. And we're showing that that's the sort of main problem that's going on there. Thanks, Weston. I believe Jack is next. Yeah, um, th thanks, Kagan. Uh, it's a great talk. Learned a lot there um, for both part one and part two uh, there. So I guess I had a little bit of a, um, different questions about the first part and the second part. I mean, I'll just start with the second part. So when, when you've got your three line graphs there at the end, you know, with showing the the increase in these different measures of evaporative demand over time, and um, then you've got the one that's just radiation. Is, is that last one, the light blue one, is that just radiation or is that epsilon over epsilon plus one times radiation? Because those might scale quite differently. Um, so is epsilon over epsilon plus one, you're actually going to get quite a bit of temperature scaling there. So is it... I'd be curious to see how, how different those are. Um, particularly, you'd expect, once you include the epsilon over epsilon plus one, that it may scale actually quite similarly to Penman because the other parts of Penman also have that scaling too. So I think that really matters which one that is. Yeah, no, so, so regardless of which you use, you don't recover these large... So I think what you're saying is if you include the epsilon, so let's let's go back. So here we go. 
Right. So the epsilon and epsilon plus one, this is equilibrium evaporation. This is well known right, to hydrologists and you. Um, but regardless of which you use there, if you plug them in, none of them are recovering that red line where you get drastic increases in PET. So oh, okay. whether you call it point 0.8 or whether you call it epsilon and epsilon plus one or various sort of other decisions people have made, you're not getting these huge increases like you see. Yeah, for yeah, yeah. But I guess I'm saying, so the reason for that may be, because I guess if you go back to the equation, decide with the equations there. So it, it so epsilon plus epsilon plus one is the scaling of the first term, but it's also roughly the scaling of that second term in the Penman equation too, because the second term there, um, most of the things, if say constant relative humidity or something, then it's just going with Q star, and that's roughly the same scaling as epsilon. They're both just go up like Clausius Clapeyron. So I, I guess I'm not quite sure it is is really that different. Is that discrepancy really coming from the leading that second term mostly, or is it actually coming from the fact that that full curve that they used was Penman Monteith. It wasn't epsilon plus one. It was something else in the denominator. I, I wonder how, how much that is due to those different things. Because I wouldn't expect deleting this. I guess what I'm saying is I wouldn't expect deleting that relative humidity term to change the relative scaling of this equation very much because that second term, that relative humidity term, also scales roughly like Clausius Clapeyron, just like the epsilon term does. So I'm surprised yeah. the difference yeah. when you delete it. Yeah, I think I think we I think we disagree on that intuition. So huh. I think by deleting it, yeah, there's a, I know you like to tell like if you if you plot these quantities, you're not getting large increases if you are huh. allowing relative humidity to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I guess I mean in a relative. Of course, in the absolute sense, the increase is going to be way less, right? Because in the absolute sense, right, you the the, the quantity is just not as large. But say in the relative sense, if you look at like a percent increase, which is what matters for that ratio, say the the you know aridity index or something that ratio of precip over PET what matters is the relative change in the PET not the absolute so if you were to do the percent change in your full Penman and then your percent change in the Penman with the deleted term I, I guess my first instinct is those percent changes should be about the same they should both be about skill like the way, way the percent anyway we can talk offline but that, that's the part that I wasn't quite sure I I, I certainly agree that that you get yeah. less why you get less I may be disagreeing on, on why it's so much less yeah, I so I'm familiar with that your, right. your paper and um and right, right. I think I think so it comes down to whether you're doing these percentage changes or not and what's in the denominator. But I right. think the bottom line is there's no clear kind of like if you just look at the changes, you're not seeing these drastic increases in PET. Yeah, when yeah, you're it's, it's, a, it's a much smaller absolute increase because the quantity yeah. itself is much smaller in the absolute, right? The, when, once you delete that second term, the, the values of PET itself just go way down, right? And so the changes go way down too, but but the... without, without without monopolizing the time here, I think it's oh, yeah, sorry. I'll go. I'll, I'll email you offline because that's... in the denominator, right? If you're using the incorrect equation for PET, then that's that's go going to be much larger. But it shouldn't actually even in the denominator be as large. We can talk more yeah. offline. Yeah, the, that the, there's be... that too. I absolutely agree. Yeah. That some of it yeah, is yeah. different than denominators as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Great. Jack. Yeah. Thanks, Jack. You can go ahead, Tempest. Tempest, you there? You should be able to unmute yourself. Let me send you a request. Sir, you're unmuted. I don't, I don't, we can't hear you though. I don't know if you want to go ahead and type your question in the chat and I'll read it out loud. Oh, oh no, they joined from a browser. Okay, go ahead and type it and then I'll just read it out loud. In the meantime, maybe if anyone else wants to have a question as, as Tempest types. And if you like Tempest join from a browser and can't unmute yourself, um, anyone is free to type a question in the chat and I will read it out loud. I want to jump in. Uh, so a uh, very impressive talk. So does that mean uh, we should change the climate model accordingly or uh, like what kind of implications um, are there for uh, uh, optimizing the climate model? Um, yeah, I, so I think there's a there's a healthy literature that is sim like a sort of a, a good start, you know, stuff that folks like, you know, Jack's written about this, Mike Roderick, many folks. That it's just a good thing to look at the directly simulated variables in the climate model rather than relying on these supply and demand arguments and that that would um immediately fix 
you know, many of these sorts of problems. Now, I, I think the broader question, though, is understanding, you know, at a basic level, how the land service should change with warming. And I think the upshot of this is there's definitely value in sort of simple theory to explain how it should change so that we have some intuition for what should happen. Um, and because the supply and demand arguments don't seem to work great, or at least in their historical form, don't seem to work great, there's still kind of an opening for um, for for um, for developing that theory. Yeah. Thank you. So we do have Tempest's question. I'm just going to go ahead and read read it. Um, hello, thanks for the great talk. Do you, could you comment on how your W profile work performs when compared to other data sources other than ERA five? How does the RH profile and soil moisture profile vary? when derived from other reanalysis products, flux towers, or remotely sensed soil moisture? Yeah, good question. Um, so the W-shaped profile is ro pretty robust qualitatively across different data sets. So for instance, we also looked in gridded um, weather station um, data sets that also measure relative humidity. And if you plot that, you also get a W-shaped profile just from the weather station data. It's a little more muted because it's at a coarser resolution. So as you would expect, that's going to mute the sort of W-shape, but it's a pretty robust feature. The soil moisture W-shaped profile, typically you get some differences across data sets in the absolute values of soil moisture. But again, the basic structure that you have this W-shape averaged over land is pretty robust depending on which data set you use, whether you use satellite soil moisture observations that we've used a fair bit um, or whether you're using a, a reanalysis per se. Thanks. Thank you. So, Kagan, you have two more questions in the chat. Do you want to go ahead and, and address those? Sure. I know we're at the hour, but I don't I don't want to keep you. No, I'm happy to. Yeah. OK, so so here's one of them. So uh, Sheila asks, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Is the stomatal closing considered as a carbon fertilization effect? Um, so so carbon fertilization is typically talking about growing more plants and this is sort of separate to that where you're causing the plants that currently exist even in the absence of growing more plants um are closing their stomata earlier so it's kind of a separate um effect in in that sense but the carbon and water cycles are tightly linked in plants and so the decisions they make about transpiration are closely linked to how much they photosynthesize and grow too Thank you. Um, another question: the EF theory red line in a slide for red line in a slide for W profile looks like it does not consider that EF could be over 1.0. For example, sensible heat could be negative in cold regions here, here in high higher latitude. Could this be another reason why the why the red line is underestimated at higher latitude? Uh, yeah. So that's that's a good question. Let me just find the slide. Here we are. Um, yeah. So I mean. The basic principle of the land surface model at the heart of that is that, you know, in most land surfaces that aren't cold, super cold at high latitudes, the evaporative fraction is always between zero and one. Um, and, um, and yeah, so that land surface model also starts to fail as you move to higher latitudes too. So that could be another reason why the theory starts to break apart as you move to these, you know, largely cold and frozen um, environments, at least for in the annual mean. Thank you. This is the last question in my queue. Um, this is also from Tempest. Um, they say, I am trying to wrap my head around your work's implication for the tropics. Is the idea that the net radiation, radiation at the surface, is still low in the tropics due to plants slash clouds? Um, I guess I don't really follow the question. I don't either. <laughs> Tempest, do you want to rephrase? 
Okay, I don't want to, I don't want to keep us too far um, across the hour. We're already kind of eating into um, Kagan's time. Maybe we can, um, maybe, maybe we can catch up with us offline. Oh, Tempest is typing slowly. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Let's, let me just, um, how about you both just hang out after this, but I'm going to close out the seminar. Maybe that's the, the most diplomatic way to do it. Um, well, thank you everybody um, for, for coming to this talk. And thank you so much, Kagan, for giving us this, this really interesting talk. Um, just as a reminder, we will have a recording of this available um, fairly soon, uh, probably the end of the week. Um, don't hold me to that. Um, anyway, so we have two more seminars um, coming up. Next week's is uh, in person. So I hope everybody comes to that. And other than that, have a lovely day, everybody. Thank you. And Tempest, I think I have your email here. I can just quickly send it to Kagan if you guys did want to, or actually, wait, I can just, let's see. Yeah, can, Tempest, I have your UMD email. I don't know if that's the best one for you. Oh, they left. <laughs> okay, never mind. Great, thanks a lot. Okay, thank you so much. See you, Jack.